Let's talk about power training today. And the primary question I wanna answer is, how heavy do you lift if you wanna maximize power? In other words, I'm trying to develop my lower body power. Should I do squats at 90% of my, my, my one rep max, 10%, 50%, right? And in other words, should I do something really light or something heavy or combination, somewhere in the middle, both? I don't really know. Today, we're gonna to get into that answer. But first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, we don't have any sponsors. This is, actually, I should let you talk. You're our sponsors. So all of you that subscribe, like, share, all that stuff, really appreciate it. Anyways, back to your answer. Well, to understand the optimal load for power, we have to look at biomechanics a little bit. And if you know me, you know how much I hate math and especially biomechanics. But this, I promise you, if a dummy like me can understand this, you can too. So we have to take a look at what's called the force velocity curve. So we know that power is equal to force multiplied by velocity. And we know that the relationship between velocity and force is inverse, right? So what you're seeing here again is called the force velocity curve. And it's very simple. The heavier something is, the slower you can move it. That doesn't take you know, a neurosurgeon to figure that out. If I said, hey, tomorrow in class or next time we meet in class rather, we're gonna run a race. And whoever wins the race gets an automatic A in the class for the whole year and you have to wear a backpack. And that backpack can be filled with five pounds, 50 pounds, or 500 pounds. You would all obviously pick the five pounds. So you know this relationship already because you know the heavier something gets, the slower it moves. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. Where this intervenes with power though, is the derivation of this. Here's what I mean. If I can multiply no force and velocity equal power, I can generate what's called a power curve. Okay, so this is our answer, right? How heavy do I lift if I want to maximize power? Well, that answer is going to be wherever this graph, this power graph, is the highest. Okay, because what that's going to tell you is, is this. Look at this part, uh, the left or kind of right, depending on how you're looking, part of the curve. Well, doing something that's really, really heavy and really forceful isn't necessarily going to be the most powerful because it's gonna to be too heavy and it's gonna make you move slow. Imagine doing a one rep max deadlift. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're gonna move a lot of force and produce a lot of force in the ground, but it won't be a, a lot of power because it's too slow. Look at the other end of the spectrum though. Okay, imagine doing a, a deadlift with three pounds. Okay, well that's not gonna be very powerful either because although you'll move really fast, there's not enough mass. I mean, just look at it from the equation perspective. You got two things that you're multiplying to get a third thing. You want both of these things to be as high as possible, but you know that these two things are actually inversely related. So when one goes up, the other goes down. So what that tells you is, well, at some point, there's going to be enough of both to give me the best possible number on the other side of the equation. Maybe Ryan can come up with some fancy graphics for that that I just did with my fingers. If not, man, don't worry about it. It's not that complicated. Or they can watch, go back and watch the video again. You can rewind. That's why I make these videos. Why I don't do all these lectures or use stupid textbooks in class, to be honest with you. So you can learn at your own pace. Biomechanics nerds, flying through this. Maybe skip the whole video. People that struggle like me, watch it a couple times. Right? Watch it at faster speed. Anyways, coming back to the original idea. Okay, so this power curve says at some point there'll be enough mass and enough velocity that power will be highest, but it won't be at one end or the other end of this force velocity spectrum. So if you're looking ahead a little bit, and you want to answer that question, okay, well, how heavy do I train if I want to maximize power? Well, according to the mathematics, that's going to be about 30%. So you should do that deadlift at about 30% of your max, or that bench press at 30% of the squat or whatever, okay? And that's based on a whole bunch of things that I don't really want to get into, some old science with fro isolated frog cells and some cool things like that. If you were to take any certification and test, uh, especially the NSCA, CSCS, and they ask you about the number or the intensity in which peak power is, is optimized, the answer will be 30%. Okay, and it's based on all this, but in real life, that's not true. In fact, the literature shows that's not true, and it doesn't even make sense cognitively. But, again, if you take those exams, write 30%, get your answer correct, get your certification, and, and move on. It's not entirely wrong either, it's just too oversimplistic which I guess is a bit of a redundant right there. I could have just said simplistic, over simplistic. Anyways, here's what I mean. Okay, we know that 
under a couple of different situations, this force velocity curve changes. So if you get stronger, not only does your max force go up, but the curve shifts as well. So people that produce, say, we'll just use the example of, uh, it doesn't actually, it actually doesn't matter. But as you get stronger, instead of producing your peak power at 30% of your one rep max, you now actually produce it at 40 or 50%. And again, look at the, at the literature. This is what it's gonna show you. Stronger individuals don't have peak power at 30%. It's more like 40, 50, 60%. Okay, another situation. The type of exercise matters. So if you compare, say, a normal bench press to what's called a bench press throw, so there are cool machines you can use, or I, I remember in high school we used to do this manually, where we would just literally throw the barbell, catch it with our own hands. Okay, the machines do that for you. You can throw it, it catches it, it lowers it back down. That's probably a bit safer than what I used to do, but we didn't have a lot of resources back then. The point being a dynamic movement versus a, an isolated movement that stops acceleration. Now, if you go back and watch one of the five minute videos I have on different types of acceleration, uh, resistance versus assistance uh, acceleration, you'll notice I talk about that whole acceleration to the end range of motion. Well, that really comes to fruition here. Finishing the exercise and not slowing down like you would in a bench press, but going through the end of the range of motion really changes the power dynamic. All right? So the bench press, actually, the literature does suggest that even for people that are reasonably strong, they're going to peak, peak power is going to occur at about 30% of your one rep max. But if you were to throw that implement, that shifts the curve to the right again. And maybe now that's at 40 or 50%. Okay. So again, the point I'm really getting at is not that you understand the difference between bench press and bench press throw, but stable movements versus dynamic movements. Peak power is going to always happen further down the intensity spectrum for the more dynamic movement. Other examples, bigger muscle groups, more complicated muscle groups, also will shift it to the right. So again, 30% for bench is not terrible, but that's probably not gonna get you peak power in your squat. Those more complicated, bigger muscle group movements happens at more like 40, 50, 60%. So we shift that thing to the right. Notice the theme here? The bigger the muscle groups, the stronger you are, the more acceleration, the more dynamic the movement, all of those things shift the curve to the right, meaning that you need to lift a little bit heavier load to optimize your power. Well, that goes even further. When we extend something more like a, uh, like a squat to something like a clean, a jerk, or a snatch, instead of peak power happening at 50 or so percent, that actually happens at closer to 80, 90, 100 percent, depending on the individual. And this is one of the reasons why we talk about this all the time, but as a general statement, people that are Olympic weightlifters or weightlifters are going to be the most powerful athletes or at least express the most power in their lifts than anyone else. That's because they spend most of their time training in a method that optimizes or maximizes, I should say, power output. So it's very, very helpful for that. To wrap all that up and conclude here, there are sort of three scenarios in which you shift the power curve or allow you to lift a heavier load and produce more force. Number one, those that are stronger. Number two, more dynamic movements. And number three, bigger muscle groups. All right. So any of those situations result in you needing to do more weight. Okay. So what I want to do now, though, is actually talk more specifically about programming for power. So I'm going to give you this famous slide. Now, I use this in all of my stuff. If you want to watch any of my hypertrophy, fat loss, conditioning, or speed videos, you're going to see the same schematic for the slide. I like to talk about the concepts. And then I'll give you some methods. The reason I do this approach is if you hit the concepts, I promise you're going to get improvements in power. The method you cho choose to do that doesn't matter as much because there's infinite methods, but only a few concepts. So uh, power, typically you're going to use complex movements. I don't see a lot of benefit in doing like isolated single joint stuff for power. It's typically multi-joint, more complicated movements. Um, even multiple movement patterns is, is great. So combining sagittal with frontal or things like that are, are a benefit. Somewhere between three and 20-ish sets. Uh, it can be even higher if you're fairly well trained. But the key is something like one to five reps per set. Okay, so you can't get powerful by not moving powerfully. If you do more than four or five reps in a row, you start to slow down, you start to compromise power. And there's not a hard and fast rule on five, but it's a pretty decent one. Typically, what we like to say is like, hey, 
two, three, four, five reps, something in that neighborhood's pretty good for power. You wanna do more of it? Well then do more sets, right? So do two or three reps, take a break. Two or three reps, take a break. And do that a bunch of times, rather than five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten reps in a row. Those last five, six, seven, eight, nine reps are gonna be slow, pure and simple, which is not aiding in power development. It's something else, right? The load that you need to do in terms of the amount that you need to lift, probably somewhere between like 30 and 75% of your one rep max. But as we just talked about, um, it, it sort of depends. I think it's fair to say though, a couple of things. The literature, my experience, and most of the coaches that I think are good at this are gonna recommend a couple of things. Number one, train across the full spectrum. There are benefits to getting faster. There are benefits to getting stronger, no doubt. So you should do some really heavy stuff. You should do some really light and fast stuff. You should do some stuff at 30, 40, 60, 70, 80. Train across that full power spectrum. It's gonna get you the most bang for your buck, but probably spend most of your time in that 60, 70, 80, 90% 90 range. 90 even really is starting to push it for most people, probably more like 60, 70, 80%. It's where you're gonna get most of your power development. Maximize your speed with all your repetitions. Of course, good technique and good quality movement, all that but you gotta go fast. And then of course, with that, you wanna maximize your rest between set. The textbook definition answer would be two to five minutes per set. Um, any Olympic weightlifter or powerlifter is gonna maximize that, go five, 10 minutes between set, which this is one of the reasons why they're in the gym for three hours and they did 15 total reps, right? But you need to be able to do that because the quality of the movement has to be there. You're not gonna improve your maximal power output by training at 80%. And if you're not resting enough in between sets and your power production goes down, that's no longer helpful. So really a ton of rest. The typical cue I will say is, hey, if you're doing a speed or a power day, and that's really all you're doing today, you probably will leave the gym going, I didn't do anything today. You won't have a great sweat going. You won't get a burn. Your lungs aren't gonna be blown out. You might leave going, oh man, like I didn't do anything. In fact, we're on a bit of a tangent here, but this is one of the reasons why I think speed and power training doesn't land very well for general public people because they want to they go to the gym they pay the money because they want to fill that that emptying of the gas tank and you just don't get that with speed or power training so a lot of commercial gyms and um, we'll say popular companies in this space will do power training but they'll just add a ton of reps right it's not actually power training of course not right you're doing endurance training you're just using a typical power movement like a kettlebell swing or a jump and you're making it a conditioning drill but that's not improving power don't be fooled there unless you're incredibly untrained, then everything works for a little bit, right? But that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about optimal situations. Okay, and because the force velocity curve is what it is, that typically means your movement should be at about 50 to 90% of max velocity. You don't really need to go higher than 90% of max velocity because that means the mass is gonna have to fall off too much. And the same thing on the other end of the spectrum with velocity, you can't be much slower than 50%. Now, I would encourage you all to Generate your own force velocity curve if you've got a gym aware or a tenno unit or something like that or a, any type of accelerometer you can put on your barbell. But those are the basic concepts. Doesn't matter much. Oh, it does matter, but this is going to get you there. All right, just, just so we can have some fun, let's go over a few different methods. Speed squat, squats are great. Uh, medicine ball tosses, throws, hops, skips, jumps. All those things are fantastic for the upper body. I love clapping push-ups if you can or uh, puts the medicine ball throws, all great. Complex training is another uh, type of training which we'll, uh, I'll get into uh, separately, but, but that's a fantastic way to train. The quick version there is doing something very heavy, shaking it out for five, 10 seconds, and then doing something immediately fast after that. So it's a, it's a very good approach. Weightlifting movements, so by this I mean Olympic weightlifting, so snatch, clean and jerk, or variations. Power clean, hang snatch, um, jerk, split jerks, all the variations of those movements are good. In fact, the jerk to me is the best movement ever because it's pretty simple, it's fairly safe, and you can generate a ton of power. Uh, snatch is generally more powerful, uh, but it, complication goes up in that one. It's a little bit tricky to pull off. And as I mentioned, jumps, sprints, plyometrics, as long as they're short and there's no fatigue being induced, these will all land you pretty well in power, okay? 
Another thing I'll also talk about in a separate video is called cluster sets, or you can Google this, but there's actually a significant amount of research in the last 10 years on cluster sets, okay? Um, this is, imagine you're doing three sets of 10, or rather, 10 sets of three, sorry. Instead of doing one, two, three reps, taking a break, you do one, take a little break, two, do, take a little break, three, take a little break, then take your normal break. You're effectively improving the quality of each repetition because you're giving yourself a little bit more rest in between each rep, which keeps you more fresh, optimizes power. So we'll talk more later in other videos about complex and cluster training specifically. But for now, I hope you learned a little bit about power training. So don't screw it up next time you go to train by doing something too light or too heavy, because it would be shameful for you to all be small, pathetic, and not powerful. I will see most of you, some of you in class in a few days or tomorrow or whatever happens to land. Much appreciated, and let's get powerful. Bye-bye.